morning, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> and welcome to this morning session in which we will have two pedagogical lectures. First, Ali Mostafa Tzadi will continue his lecture on, on scattering theory, time independent scattering theory, and after that, Michael Hattridge will start an, an, a new series. So. So, um, let's see, yesterday I uh, showed you that if this is scattering potential, uh, it satisfies time independent Schrodinger equation, I could define the two component uh, state vector, which has this form. And this two component uh, state vector satisfies the time dependent Schrodinger equation, where really I should put a prime, and prime is derivative with respect to x. And this Hamiltonian, the two component Hamiltonian, has this form. I gave you the explicit form and also this form, and I will write a shorter version. Where this K matrix is just one, one, minus one, minus one. <laughs> This is, this, I mean, it's the third line. solution. No, third line. Yeah. The solution comes here. This is the definition of this two component state vector. And two component state vector satisfies this differential equation with this Hamiltonian. Two component state vector you just construct or? I did construct it yesterday. Oh, okay. This is what I did yesterday. So it's, the aim was, that this object goes to a plus minus b plus minus when x goes to plus or minus infinity. That was the key. Okay? And because of this asymptotics, I could show the main result that the transfer matrix is nothing but time ordered exponential of this Hamilton. <clears throat> then what I did was to truncate this uh, potential, introduce a y dependence, which is the value of x which in which I truncated, and then I get a y dependent m and I could write a differential equation for that y-dependent m and recover this as a solution of initial value problem. Uh, and then I uh, also have the relationship between the transfer matrix uh, and the reflection transmission coefficients. So I feed this into that differential equation. I obtain differential equations for R's and T, which I didn't write. And then I told you that I could simplify and write everything in terms of uh, a differential equation defined on an arc of a circle in complex plane. 
And the last thing I did was to show you that this can be used to uh, obtain unidirection invisible uh, potentials. So one example was to construct this potential. I told you how you can do it. And for k equal to k0, uh, what you find is that by construction, uh, the right reflection vanishes, transmission is equal to 1, and the ref left reflection can be obtained by a simple contour integral, and the result is this. Here, this alpha is a real number bigger than minus 1 over 4, and n is a positive integer. Uh, I also should mention that this L is pi n over k0. So this potential has two free parameters, n and alpha. And by changing this n and alpha, because alpha can be as small as you wish, and in as large as you wish, you can always control the right reflection, at least the magnitude. And then I said, look, if you define a potential, which is the same potential moved by B, then this is a translation, and the effect of translation on uh, scattering data is that the translations don't change the transmission coefficient and the left transmission coefficient go like 2i k 0 d r l because I'm confining myself to k 0 and r r goes to e to the minus 2i k 0 d r r so this is 0 this is 1 so this will be also unidirectionally invisible, but its uh, left uh, reflection, I can control the face. So by choosing this D properly and alpha and N, you have a fully tunable uh, in unidirection invisible potential. This is the a known example of that. <clears throat> now, if you can build uh, right invisible potentials, you can easily build left invisible potentials. Uh, by the way, it is good to also see that when you have right invisibility, this m becomes at, I mean, at k is equal to k0. This is 1. This is 0. This is 0, so I get 0 minus RL and 1. So the matrix is lower triangular. And remember, under time reversal, uh, M goes to sigma 1, M star sigma 1. So if I take the time reversal of this potential, that is just complex conjugated. It's transfer matrix, but what these do, they just change the diagonals, and what you find is 1, 1, minus R, L star, 0. And you see, it is now left invisible. So you can uh, construct right invisible and left invisible potentials, which are completely tunable. That is, the 
reflection, which is not zero, can be adjusted. It, this can be implemented in optics because in optics, the potential is um, k squared 1 minus the permittivity. So you just sub equate this to this. At k equal to k0, you get a formula for epsilon. And what happens about what is the physical uh, meanings of these parameters, that these just the position of the support, you move it around. So this is like a slab. So D tells you where to put the slab. And then this N is kind of because of this property is the number of periods that this uh, function repeats. So this is like a multi-layer slab. It has n uh, layers. And this alpha here uh, essentially tells you uh, the gain-loss modulation of tiny layers. <clears throat> OK, so This has applications, as I tried to men um, briefly mention last time, in inverse scattering. What do I mean by that? Suppose you want to build an optical device with specific scattering properties. That is, you are interested to, uh, in designing an, a slab with particular left reflection, right lift reflection, and transmission at some wave number k0. How do you design such a thing? So it is, the problem is the opposite. You are given the scattering data at one frequency, or one wave number, and you're interested in constructing a potential which achieves this for, the, for you. Well, obviously, you can try to use the inverse scattering formalism, which was developed in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, but that leads to horrible integral equations. There's no exact way of solving them. And uh, if you, for example, try to recover barrier potential, you can solve it exactly, find reflection transmission coefficient for the barrier potential, and give it to the inverse scattering formalism and ask to reproduce the barrier, you find that it gives you infinitely poles and you have to, there's no way you can do it by hand. Now, this unidirectional invisible potentials that I constructed achieve this in two lines. Um, obviously, there are infinitely many potentials which will have this data, but if you're interested in optical design at a particular frequency, that's what you have, and you can use any of these potentials if you can construct them. So how do you do that? <clears throat> now you break up the problem into three possibilities, three cases. Phase one is when uh, both the reflections are zero. So you have a device which just has transmission, uh, which can amplify your wave or change, shifts its phase. And you tell me what you want. So this is reflectionless from both sides. Um, Suppose for some purpose you need such a device. And then what you do, you take four uh, potentials um, with support. These are all finite uh, range potentials, I1, I2, I3, I4. And you, so they are, they are like four of these slabs, uh, and the supports are where they don't vanish. So this is I1, I2, I3, and I4, and you arrange it 
like this. So you first put uh, the first one, second one, third one, and fourth one. And because I make them separate, the transmission, uh, the transfer matrices you can compose. And if I take the potential V to be the sum because of the uh, composition property, I get this formula. Still, I haven't told you what this v1, v2, v3, v4 are. I will identify this with potentials like vd and vd star, which are either left invisible or right invisible. And I, since I can construct them, I will just tell you what the uh, reflection that is not zero is. Okay? So I will just tell you what these are. So I will take M1 to have this form 1, 0, rho, T0, 1. This T0 is my one of the data that I am given. So this one is right invisible. Okay. The second one I take to be 1, T0 minus 1 over rho. Zero, zero, 001. So this is uh, left invisible. Again, I can construct that. M3, 1, 0, minus rho 1. Again, this is right invisible. And M4 is 1, 1 minus T0, rho 1, 1. Uh, sorry. Zero, 01, and this is left invisible, the only thing which remains is this row. And this row can be um, anything. So I can choose it anything which is not zero. You can take it to be one, doesn't matter. So all the potentials with these scattering data I can construct. I know how to do it. So I can construct these four slabs and I put it and the old construction is because if you take these formulas four matrices and multiply them in this way you discover that the result is one over t zero 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 oops one over t zero which if you compare with the general case you see it is left, right, reflectionless, and the transmission is T0. So it achieves the case that these are 0, and T0 is given to you. So case 2, one of them is uh, non-zero. Let me take the three cases that are the both reflections are zero, uh, the left one is zero, right one is zero. These are the three cases. In this case, what I'll do, I again take my potentials with these, um, and I choose this row parameter, which was free in that construction, to have this form. Okay, so there was this row. So now the row is fixed because this is also given to me. And I introduce a V tilde potential which has this transfer matrix, which is again right invisible. So this time I define my V to be V1 tilde, V2 and V3, the sum. Again, I arrange that V1 tilde as support is to the left. And because there are three of them, the transfer matrix for this will be M3, M2, M1 tilde. So you have M2, M3. Now I have fixed this row to be this number 
and this is M1 tilde. Here again, just do matrix multiplication, and what you find is So it gives you what you want. It has the right, uh, the correct re reflection and transmission amplitude. The case three is similar. So you take this, and the same approach works. Yeah. Oh. Yes. So uh, please let me understand the, the first case, this result with the four potential, the most simplest one, the most generic one, which I mean, this potentials are this potential shifted, properly shifted. Yes. So, I mean, this is just one example yes. using that potential, how to construct this, yes. Yes. but okay. So I construct one potential which has R0 mm -hmm. and T0 is what you give me. Yes. So can you do it now, for instance, you want that transfer, uh, M transfer matrix, which is uh, reflectionless at this K0, but only with one B, another one. So can you do it? This one is, um, one of them is non-zero. The other one can be zero. No, 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 let's, I'm talking about the first case. Yes. Okay. So imagine that I want that transfer matrix of the first case, the final one, M, which is reflectionless to both sides, that one. Yes. yes. And I want to know this, which is the potential that produced this. It's this one. No, but only with one B, not that one. Can I solve that problem? One V to be the sum of the four. Add them up. No, but uh, okay. My question is: we let's forget about this particular form of B, another form of B. Yeah. So I want to solve. Know the potentials that have that property at that case zero. All potentials. Yes. That is an open problem. Okay. Thank you. The problem is: can I find a potential that achieves this, and I construct for you at least one case? So you see, at most four, generically three such slabs will achieve what you want. <laughs> and this is one of the nice applications of unidirection invisibility that was not recognized before. OK, this essentially completes one dimensions. Now I have to do, go to two dimensions, and I have to be very fast. <coughs> So, I, in 2015, I think, I gave a talk on this uh, dynamical formulation of scattering theory in a conference. Uh, and one of the people in the audience asked me, uh, can you do it for two dimensions? Uh, it was essentially one of my uh, former kind of students from Iran, who is a prominent physicist, uh, very, very bright guy. Um, and my immediate answer was no. <laughs> and why no? Because you see, in one dimension, you are on the real axis, which has an ordering. And this is how you order the way you multiply transfer matrices. Well, in two dimensions, uh, there is no ordering. So I would say, no, I don't think you can do it. Uh, the following summer, uh, he visited me, and uh, he said, let's try to <laughs> do it, although we think it's impossible. And it didn't take much to solve this problem. <laughs> in two dimensions, there is no direction, but the scattering setup gives you a direction because there is a source and there is a detector, right? You just connect them. That gives you one axis, and you can use that axis to order things. So 
Oh. So let's see how this can be done. So in two dimensions, so I go to 2D, I am given a potential which depends on two variables. It satisfies uh, the Schrodinger equation. And again, I assume that it dies out very rapidly so that asymptotically I have plane wave solutions. Um, the standard uh, expression for the scattering solution in two dimension, it's asymptotics, is that you have an incident wave part, R is the position vector, plus the scattering piece, which in two dimension is given uh, by this formula. This piece is a convention, this I and squared, uh, I mean, if you can make it two or five or remove that I, it doesn't matter. This is called the scattering amplitude uh, with, and the aim of the scattering, solving a scattering problem is to find the scattering amplitude for a given potential. Uh, this K0 is the wave vector for the incident wave, so you have xy, so there is an incident plane wave with k0, which is k times some unit vector. And I will take this to be uh, an angle theta 0, and um, this is theta, this is r, it's polar coordinates, so this r and theta are the polar coordinates. So, how do we proceed to find, first of all, there is no, there was no definition of a, a transfer matrix. So the aim is actually to define a transfer matrix which has similar properties uh, to the one that we know in one dimension. So what we did is said, well, how do we go from two dimensions to one dimensions? Well, string theories would compactify things, but <laughs> I don't, I can't compactify the space. Uh, one way is to Fourier transform one of the coordinates. So we Fourier trans take, took the Fourier transform with respect to y. So this x-axis is going to be a kind of the scattering axis for us. <clears throat> and we Fourier transform with respect to y. I call it psi tilde, and the definition we use uh, is this. So inverse Fourier transform we will reproduce this and you get a 1 over 2 pi. So what do you get if you Fourier transform your wave equation? So I'm only Fourier transforming with respect to y, so this derivative becomes just p squared. Uh, so I get uh, derivative with respect to x survives. Derivative with respect to y becomes p squared. And then I have to Fourier transform the product of these two. Uh, I can write the result like this. And the right hand side is this. 
So formally, if you are given some potential with some formula, you replace y with this i times derivative respect to p. This is what we teach in undergraduate quantum mechanics, right? From x space to p space. That's how things uh, transform. But you can also say, well, how do I get this? Uh, I, I kind of took the Fourier transform of the product. That's a convolution, right? So you can actually uh, show that if you have a test function, in this case, this is a test function, this is minus infinity to plus infinity, the q, v tilde of x and uh, q minus p, uh, or p minus q, times phi of p, phi of p. This is more precise. So you Fourier transform your potential with respect to second coordinate, you get this. And this convolution integral essentially defines you this operator. So I can take it to be this. So this is an integral operator. But this is not wrong. I mean, <laughs> you want to calculate the effect of this on, a, on this, you essentially need to do uh, this convolution integral. Okay, now as you see, there's this p squared times psi tilde and k squared. So I can just move it, this piece to the other side, and that gives me minus del squared plus vxi del p psi tilde xp is equal to k squared minus p squared. I call it omega squared of p. So what is this omega of p is the square root of k squared minus p squared, okay? I'm missing a 1 over 2 pi here. With that convention for the definition of the Fourier transform, you get this 1 over 2 pi in the convolution integral. Okay, so, so what? I just did a Fourier transform. Now you see this equation looks very much like this equation. <laughs> if you just consider what happens to x, it's identical. Hmm? And I follow the same route. That is, I define an analog of this two component wave. Okay? And I can get a Hamiltonian. It satisfies this relation. Because of the same calculation that I did last time apply to this case. So that gives that analysis gives a two component uh, state vector. Now, this times it will also depend on p, because everything depends also on p, uh, which has the same formula. I mean, it's exactly the same por formula. The, in the place of k, I have this omega. That's the only difference. <laughs> so I actually copy the same formula. Um, and I find, uh, maybe I, I should explain, so how did we get this formula, maybe you forgot. So we've, we got this formula by this requirement, right? So what is this requirement here? 
Uh, maybe I should have explained that before. So from here, I have this wave equation. I demand that the x-dependence of V is so that it decays fast enough so that asymptotically, uh, this has plane wave solutions. For example, if the potential is confined to an interval over x-axis, like again a slab, a strip with finite width on the slab, that will be obviously the case. So if, or if it de exponentially decays, it will have that effect. So if I make that assumption on the definition of this potential, I will get asymptotic solutions uh, will, which have uh, plane waves and I can take their linear combination and these can have um, coefficients and these coefficients can depend on P. plus for plus infinity, minus for minus infinity. So what I'm saying is that in this picture, I have uh, the potential has some uh, support. Suppose outside it vanishes, so when I go to minus infinity along the x-axis or plus infinity along the x-axis, it's free wave. So potential vanishes, so this is gone. Obviously, I should have a linear combination of plane waves, which is that. There is an important difference. The difference is that for this to be plane wave, this omega of P should definitely be real, right? If that is real, uh, where is the definition of omega? P should be not bigger than K or less than minus K. So. This says absolute value of P should be less than K. And that means that these coefficients, which are functions of P, should be zero whenever P exceeds K or is less than minus K. So A plus minus P and B plus minus P are zero for P absolute value of P bigger than K. Okay? So I work in the space of functions of P that vanish outside of an interval minus K to K. If I confine myself to this function space, then this operator acts on an element of that function space and produces an element of that function space uh, when, well, in this integral, q from minus infinity to k, minus k to zero, so I can remove this and make it into k, and this I can remove and make it into k. You see, operator appears here, it acts on this thing, and this thing is a linear combination of a p's and b p's, which vanish outside of that interval, so I'm in that function space. Now, I have this A plus B plus, and I construct my two component uh, state vector so that this again goes to A plus minus P, B plus minus P for X going to plus or minus P. And I mean, if you demand that this holds, you obtain this formula. That's the same thing which I did. And by the way, since I have introduced this uh, A plus minus B plus minus, I can write down what uh, the transfer matrix is. It is defined to be exactly like one dimension to satisfy this equation. So this is the definition of my transfer matrix in two dimensions. Exactly the same as one dimension. The only difference is that now these are not, not numbers. They are functions. So this is a matrix 
which is not a numerical matrix, it's a matrix whose entries are operators, the linear operators. <clears throat> okay. So returning to this calculation, so we got this two component state vectors with this asymptotic uh, behavior, and then you use this relation or psi tilde to get a Hamiltonian form. And the Hamiltonian you obtain is this thing. It's 1 over 2 omega p e to the minus i omega p sigma 3 dx I e p k i omega p missing an x here x sigma you see it's almost identical to the one dimension the only difference is in one dimension I have the potential which was a function of x coming here but obviously I could take this potential put it here right there it doesn't matter where I put it. But now this is an operator. So I can't move it around. And the place of k, I have omega, which is a function of uh, p. Uh, this capital K is the same matrix, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. And you see that this is an operator, which depends on p. So when it acts on something like this, a two-component wave function, you multiply by this matrix. This is a diagonal matrix with phases on the diagonal. Then you apply this matrix, and then you apply this non-local operator. And you can't move this to the there, right? Because you can't move this through this because this depends on P. Oh, I have gotten rid of y coordinate by Fourier transformation, right? I did Fourier transformation. I have no y left. I have p. And again, by the same argument, well, this m, which takes a minus b minus 2, b plus, a plus, b plus, because of this asymptotics, is essentially the evolution operator from minus infinity to plus infinity for that Hamilton. So I have the same time ordered exponential form in two dimensions. Now, because this is evolution operator, it satisfies the composition rule for evolution operators, right? X plays the role of time, so if I have my potential something like this, this is the support of the potential, if I dissect the support into pieces, Call this I1, I2, I3, I4, and this is I5. Then evol evolution operator from this point to this point times evolution operator from the left from this to this will give you from this to this point, right? So what happens is that you can dissect the, the support of your potential you restrict your potential to that smaller region in your uh, support. This defines a new scattering potential. For that, you can define a transfer matrix, which is again a function of P, and then the total transfer matrix will be the product. Again, exactly like before. 
But you understand that these are operators. So it's not matrix multiplication, it's composition. You multiply like matrices and then you compose the operators when they hit one another. So this has uh, almost exactly the same features as uh, the one-dimensional transfer matrix. But I'm missing the main step. So what is got the, what this got to do with the scattering? <laughs> How do I get the uh, scattering amplitude out of M? That was the most difficult part because the rest comes from one dimensions exactly. Um, so let me try to explain how that works. Okay. So I have to hurry up. So first of all, compare this asymptotics with this. So the incident wave comes from here, so it comes from x minus infinity. So somehow I have to generate this piece uh, from this piece. But now you see this is Fourier transformed, that's not. So I just do inverse Fourier transform to write the formula for psi x and y. So this becomes 1 over 2 pi. Uh, minus infinity plus infinity dp e to the i p y of that thing, right? a plus minus p e to the i omega p x plus b e plus minus x. That's it. And this depends on p. This is x going to plus or minus infinity. Okay, now I come to this formula. I realize that a, a plus minus and b plus minus vanish for p less than minus k and p bigger than k. So this I can change. Okay, now I see when x goes to minus infinity, I have to work with the minus sign. Okay, this is right going wave because this is always positive. Okay, so this A minus should give me the incident wave. That is this factor. Okay, how can I get it? Well, it's easy. This should be 2 pi. This 2 pi should cancel this 2 pi. And then I should, if you multiply this by that, it's essentially e, dot, uh, e to the i k dot r. I want k to be k0, so what I need to do is to just put the delta function so that when I do the delta function integral, I precisely get e to the i p0y i omega p0 of x. What is p0? p0 is the y component of um, k0. That was the incident uh, wave vector, okay? So if you substitute this uh, at x minus infinity here, you recover the incident wave piece. Now, on the other hand, when I do scattering, I send the wave from minus infinity from here, and then it scatters. And nothing comes from plus infinity toward the scatter, right? That says, if I go to x plus infinity, I shouldn't have a left-going wave. Left-going wave, the coefficient is b plus. So I should have b plus of p equal to 0. Okay? So... These are essentially the conditions for having a scattering solution. This is the most general plane wave solution. These are the scattering solutions. These are conditions for having a scattering solution. 
Next. Let's look at the scattering piece. This I call psi scattering, scattered wave. So that is psi minus this piece, right? So psi scattered is total psi minus e to the i k0 dot r. If I look at its asymptotic as minus infinity, well, when I took x to minus infinity, I have the asymptotic formula here with a minus, which is this delta. This delta will essentially give this incident wave, so they will cancel, only there will be minus term left. So, psi scattered of xy will be uh, just 1 over 2 pi integral uh, dp e to the i k dot r b minus of p. And if you multiply this with that, that's just k dot r. Uh, Maybe I should save it somewhere. So this k is uh, omega p plus or minus and p. It's plus when in, I'm at minus infinity, so it's because it points toward the center. And it's minus if I'm at x minus, at x plus infinity. So what about... Uh, x going to plus infinity, in that case, uh, psi scattered is 1 over 2 pi minus k dp. Well, at plus infinity, I have a plus and b plus, but p plus is 0. Okay? So I just get a plus piece. Uh, I a p e to the i omega p x. This is all the solution. I have to subtract this. Subtraction of this is like putting here an a, so this a plus, a minus of p times the same thing. Why? Because this is just the delta function. So it will, I mean, I told you that if you integrate over this, you get uh, this piece. So I'm subtracting that piece. So I combine these two. What I find is a difference of a's. And then I have e to the i p y e to the i uh, plus i omega. And this becomes, again, i k dot r. So what governs the scattered part of the um, solution is b minus at x going to minus infinity and b plus uh, and this difference at x going to plus infinity. So we call this t minus of p and we call this plus of p because they appear in further calculations. Okay, So this governs essentially what is reflected back, back to minus infinity, and this is what is transmitted to plus infinity. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So with this uh, definition, Psi scattered is 
uh, written as 1 over 2 pi integral minus k k dp e to the i k dot r t plus minus of p when x goes to plus minus infinity. And by definition, this thing is this, right? That was the definition. So this must be equal to the square root of i over kr e to the i kr f of theta. Okay? This is valid for r going to infinity. So valid for x plus minus infinity. Now, somehow you see the scattered amplitude, scattering amplitude should be related to t plus minus. This is inside an integral, but notice that I have to take the limit of x going to plus or minus infinity. When you take x to plus minus infinity, this exponential has some asymptotic expressions involving delta functions. And that I can't show you because it's lengthy calculation. It's in appendix A of this paper. Uh, you do that analysis and you get this amazing result. Minus i k cosine theta over square root of 2 pi t plus of k cosine theta or cosine theta positive e minus k cosine theta or cosine theta negative. What this cosine theta positive means, okay, uh, because this is theta, so this is the positive piece and this is the negative. So when theta, you're interested in theta is between minus pi over 2, pi over 2, you use the top and for theta between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, you use this. So, I could relate, write an expression for the scattering amplitude in terms of this t plus minus. Now, the thing is that t plus minus, you see, t minus is b minus. t plus is the difference of a plus b, a minus. And my transfer matrix relates a plus minus uh, to b plus minus. So it will relate t's. Okay? So it takes a very, very short calculation to derive that formula. Uh, So, uh, from here, I can solve for a plus as what? t plus plus a minus, and b minus is just t minus, right? And a minus, this is 2 pi delta p minus p0, right? So I write a plus, which is t plus plus 2 pi delta p minus p0. B, b plus is 0, right? I told you. This is a plus b plus. m, let me write in its components. a minus is 2 pi delta p minus p0, and b minus is t minus. Okay? Now, let's first 
multiply the second row. Second row by this is zero. So you get m21 times 2 pi delta p minus p0 plus m22 t minus equal to zero. <clears throat> and the first row will give you m, again, 2 pi, m11 delta p minus p0 plus m12 t minus is equal to t plus plus 2 pi delta p minus p0. Okay? Now, from the first equation, you can find t minus. So, what is t minus? It is minus 2 pi. I have to multiply by the inverse of that operator, m21 delta p minus p0. Okay? And then you take this formula, substitute here, get t plus. And that gives you this expression, 2 pi minus m12, m22 minus 1, m21 plus m11 minus 1 times delta p minus p2. So, if I know the transfer matrix, I know the components. These formulas gives T plus T minus in terms of the transfer matrix, and T plus T minus gives you the scattering amplitude. So this is uh, the most you can ask for. There is an important technical difficulty here in these equations, and that is T. Uh, the inverse of M22 appears. M22 is an operator. So that's usually difficult to do. <clears throat> Last year in Bad Honef, I showed a very simple application of this scheme to find uh, invisible potentials perfect invisible potentials in two dimensions, which are uh, finite, uh, they are broadband. Uh, I plan to show you the proof, but I don't have time. Can we switch to the PowerPoint? So I will show you one uh, application of this scheme for solving uh, some scattering problems which were not solvable before. How many time? 22 minutes? Maybe you should turn off the lights on the black one. So this is uh, applications of this scheme for solving, and solving by exact solution, I mean really exact solution, closed form expressions for the transfer, uh, for the scattering matrix. So uh, there are two classes that you can solve exactly that we know. I mean, the ones that we know. One of them are these singular potentials. So this is a two-dimensional potential. The x dependence is with the delta, but y dependence is arbitrary. So if you feed this to these equations uh, for the Hamiltonian, which was this, you obtain this formula. The Hamiltonian is given, the delta function comes here, g is this integral operator, which essentially is that, I mean, convolution of g, the function g, and k is this matrix 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. This i and minus i, I introduced for simplicity. Excuse me? 
look. It's a delta function along the x-axis, but the y depends on arbitrary function so far. I will give you the, some specific example, but I mean, this is a singular potential along a line, along the y-axis, but on the y-axis it has some modulations. <clears throat> Now, if you remember, the, the time order exponential means really this. And the amazing thing about this Hamiltonian is that this k, which is given by this, the square of k is 0. So when you substitute this formula here, you get k squared, which is 0. So this series terminates. <laughs> so what you find is a closed form expression for the transfer matrix. These are the m11, m12, m21, m22 that appear in this formulas there. So these are the formulas I wrote again. So you have to just substitute these in these formulas and try to get f of theta. So it turns out that t plus and t minus are identical. This has to do with the fact that I have a delta function along the x-axis. So I have a kind of parity symmetry along the x-axis, but you see I have to invert this g, which is um, an integral operator. That's the technical problem. Now it turns out, so I have, I need to just find t plus, because they are equal, so this is the equation for the scattering amplitude. Again, I, this is where I started, and this is essentially the definition of t plus. t plus my, was a plus minus a minus, it turns out that if you write this equation in terms of a plus, it simplifies. It becomes this equation. <laughs> now this, you should say, well, this is the Green's function. <laughs> but this is not a differential operator, it's an integral operator. So it's somehow it's Green's function for an integral operator. So the scheme is, you give me a g, I find this operator. And I try to solve this integral equation. I find a plus. That will give me t plus. And then I use t plus in this formula to get the scattering amplitude. So this is the scheme for solving scattering problems using this method. Now we could find an exact solution of this integral equation for four classes. The first class is a bunch of two-dimensional delta functions along, uh, aligned along a line. It's a finite array of arbitrarily positioned delta functions with arbitrary even complex uh, coefficients. The second class is multi-periodic functions like this. So this alpha n is arbitrary, so you have several periods. Zn is complex. There are finitely many. The third class is arbitrary periodic functions along y. So this is just Fourier transform, uh, Fourier series, which says that along the y-axis, this gy is periodic. Again, the coefficients can be complex. The period is real. And finally, this is what is known as Dirac comb. Right? It's an infinite array, periodic array, of delta functions put on one line in two dimensions. So this is the first class. This is the shape, <laughs> if you want to see the graph. <laughs> so it turns out that you can solve this integral equation using this ansatz. Uh, I can't explain where we find it, but you think a little, <laughs> you see that it should be like that. Uh, so, what is the answer? It says these are given, these are given, the unknowns are these xn's. And you feed this formula into this equation, you find a system of linear equations for xn. <laughs> the finite matrix coefficients in which a Bessel function appears. But you can solve it. Now, you might say, well, who says this system has a solution, right? Well, it doesn't have a solution. You have a spectral singularity. 
essentially blows up the Terminal 2 zero. Okay. The second uh, simple example, one delta function in two dimension, which has a lot of history. Yesterday we uh, had some uh, discussion about two dimensional delta function. In using the standard uh, scattering theory, it blows up and you have to do renormalization or self-adjoint extensions. Well, our method gives you a finite result. Uh, we actually dig through the renormalization schemes and found out that this does renormalization implicitly and chooses the renormalization scale. Now, so this two-dimensional delta function is scale-free, right? Doesn't have a scale. So how do you choose the scale? Well, the scattering theory, scattering setup will give you a scale, right? Incoming wave has an energy. K. So if you fix the renormalization scale to be K, you find this. This t theta zero is the angle of the incident wave. Okay. Two delta functions. Well, this is not the most general, but this is the smallest <laughs> formulas that we could put on board. This is two delta functions um, put symmetrically along uh, about the x-axis. And again, you can find this expression for the scattering amplitude. These uh, coefficient functions are again involved by cell functions. Again, if this is zero, you get the specular singularities and so on. So the second class, this is sum of exponentials, which are each of them have, can have different uh, periods. Uh, well, you can show that you can always assume that this alpha ends satisfy this property because you can generate terms with zeta n equal to zero. So if one of the terms are absent, you can put it there, but assume that the coupling constant is zero. So you can always make this assumption about this alpha ends. And then this ansatz solves the integral equation but it took us a lot of time to determine uh, where these m's are. So this alpha vector is the vector of periods. There are n of them. And these mn's are subsets of n-dimensional lattice which satisfy this condition. So it's always a finite set. Xn's, therefore, are a finite number of unknowns. Again, they satisfy a linear system of equation that you can solve. So for each k you give me, there is a finite set of unknowns, and that is the size of your system of equations. I don't, I mean, I don't want to bore you with lengthy formulas. Again, if there is no solution, it means a spectral singularity arises. Now, this case leads to this very interesting theorem. It says, suppose you have a periodic function here. This is an arbitrary periodic function with period alpha. The scattering amplitude for this thing becomes equal to the scattering amplitude for this. This is truncated after n. What is n? n if n satisfies this relation, so if your frequency is bounded by this number when n is an integer, then the scattering problem for this and this coincide. Again, the proofs are here. Let me give you an example. Take the Dirac along the y-axis, an infinite array of delta functions, and you want to do scattering for that. Well, you know that the delta function admits a <laughs> expansion in terms of exponentials. You define alpha to be 2 pi over a. a is this thing, the separation of the bit and the two delta functions. And this becomes an, an example of this case. Okay. So what does this theorem tell you about the Dirac comp? It says that if your energy, wave number, is less than alpha over 2, alpha is a kind of 2 pi over the distance between the delta functions, then the rock comp acts exactly like one delta function. <laughs> the 
that is the scattering amplitude of the single delta function is the same as the Dirac comp. If k is between alpha over 2 and alpha, then you have two more modes of the Fourier series coming and giving you a cosine. And this potential has the same amplitude as the Dirac comp, which is, I mean, I have no intuition for it. Why it's true, I don't know, but it is true. So for each value of k that you give me, I truncate this, I get sines and cosines. And I can solve that problem and give the, the whole thing. Okay, the second class, which is by far more interesting, because it's not singular, is this class of potentials. They are finite along the x-axis. So you can imagine like a slab along the x-axis. Along, uh, so between 0 and a, it's non-zero. And y-dependence and x-dependence for x between a and 0 is this thing. This v0 is some potential which is in one dimension is exactly solvable. So you can take it to be zero free particle or a barrier potential or what any which exactly solvable potentials in one dimension. V1 is completely arbitrary function. And the claim is, and I'll show you, you can solve the scattering problem for this exactly, although V1 is arbitrary. But this is a typical uh, shape for the absolute value. <clears throat> now, the trick that allows you to do that is that when you compute this operator for this potential, this exponential becomes just a sh translation in P. Okay? Now, remember, you work in a function space where functions vanish if their argument is bigger than K or minus, less than minus K. So if I do S alpha enough number of times, eventually I hit zero, okay? Because of this, that expansion of the transfer matrix again terminates. It's not this simple, <laughs> but this is the basic idea. If V zero is, oh, maybe I should. So this is what I explained, I just explained. So if V zero is not there, Obviously, H will have this S alpha, and there will be copies of S alpha in each term, and that will terminate this term. If V0 is there, you play with the, the game of doing a, some uh, similarity transformation with the transfer matrix for V0, which you know, and then you return it to this case. Anyhow, the point is that the transfer matrix has a closed form expression. This is the integer part of 2K. Again, it depends on your energy. Uh, the higher the energy, more terms in this expansion. And you can find the scattering amplitude. Amazingly, the scattering amplitude is a bunch of delta functions. What does that tell you? Is that you have rays coming out of your slab with definite angles and definite momenta. So these are the angles. <clears throat> and these coefficients can be computed explicitly. OK? Now, this is very, very interesting because of the following. Suppose your k is less than alpha. In that case, the only thing which comes out is along the x-axis. And the transmitted and reflected waves are governed by this V0. So this V1 part does not uh, contribute. So if this is 0, which you can make it 0, then this slab will be invisible. Everything will go through. For this cut, this is one manifestation of this invisibility theorem I talked about last year. But what happens if k is between 2 alpha and alpha? Remember, what is this alpha? Alpha is this period, which has the dimension of momentum, or 1 over length. So if alpha, k is between alpha and 2 alpha, only one pair of upward going rays, scattering rays, appear. It doesn't go be below the x-axis. There is a direction, because this alpha is taken to be positive. If alpha is negative, then they go down. 
If you increase the energy, you will generate two pairs and three pairs and four pairs like that. This is, reminds me of photoelectric effect. Why? Because if you don't have enough energy, nothing comes up. And once you increase the energy, there are discrete values of energy at which you generate creation of these rays. It's very, very interesting. And it has also physical consequences because if you look at the momenta of this scattered waves, they have this form. This theta angle, the sine is this thing. So the y component of momenta are quantized. And their x component are oppositely related. It's they change by, I mean, they differ by a sign. So somehow they are entangled, they have entangled momentum. The X component of their momentum are entangled, and the Y component of their momentum is quantized. So, again, going back to the expression for the scattering amplitude, well, you can make, can arrange the parameters of your system that these coefficients blow up. That gives you spectral singularities, and in optics, it corresponds to lasing along these directions. So you, you get directional lasers. You can control the angle of uh, the outgoing waves. Also, there is this um, n, which is an integer. It's like a, an additional mode number in laser. Physics, you have this mode and they blaze, right? There's one integer. This is the second integer. So you, it increases the number of modes in a laser, so this can be used uh, in multi-mode blazing. Well, that is the references. This, this is the basic reference for the two-dimensional thing that I talked about. And this is for invisibility. This is um, this potential that I showed you. And this one is with the singlet potentials. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ami. So, other questions? As I am understanding, you last three talks. Sometimes I'm in attendee, sometimes out of mind. That all of you for formalism that you have built up as exact as possible. And the second thing is this you can apply this formalism in quantum dot, particularly the two day after the second two day. I think if you get any good student, you should give a look. The yeah. very good solution you will get of this quantum dots. So the basic problem with that is that I don't have good students. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a physical I'm looking problem. for <laughs> many. <laughs> Other questions? So in two dimension, you have a criteria that uh, x going to plus minus infinity, that damping has to be strong such so that going to uh, zero, right, or function. So uh, uh, that y component, uh, whatever it is, you can have, but uh, somewhere there is a interrelation between them to have that how many arrays will come out on that. Uh, for this potential that I showed you, uh, the y dependence is this. So it's actually periodic along y, but inside this region, x dependence is arbitrary. So it doesn't decay along y. Uh, going back to 1D, you had this, um, this bisection in four potentials or in three potentials. What determines the, the number of potentials, number of dissections, V1, V2, V3, V4 in one example and only three in the other? So, so there, are, there were three cases. Yeah. The first case was that the, it was reflectionless from Re both ends required and you four. needed four. The other cases you need just three. And this is the minimum number you need. 
I did the, the, the first paper I wrote on this, I used six. I okay. couldn't see that I could re reduce I, it to three. And then I added an addendum, <laughs> which I could reduce it to three. So it's could, the minimum number. So you could do it for six and eight as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, if you can do this, three, sure. yeah. what you want it with eight. Oh, I forgot to mention, everything Ooh. I said about two dimensions generalizes to three dimensions, and those references include <laughs> the discussion of three dimensions. It's, I didn't have time, and also a little messy, but essentially the point is that everything is related to this x-axis. So you choose one x-axis, and you integrate over the whatever other dimensions are. So you Fourier transform about y and z, for example. One of those things which you don't have time for, maybe going to complex uh, analytic as matrix here is uh, reformulated along transition matrix. Uh, the point is that this is very new, and there are so many things you can do with it. We actually saw like three completely new things. Finished the <laughs> calculations, I didn't have time to write it up. And there are many things which can do. As, as I mentioned, I don't have students, so <laughs> I wished I had. <laughs> okay, the scattering amplitude, of course, you can, from that, you can determine a cross section. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In the usual. Absolute value square. Okay. I see no more hands rising up. So let's thank Ali again for this very instructive sequence of pedagogical lectures.